one of the things that that came out of the Lindbergh saga was the X Prize. Correct. All right, so I'm the co-founder of the X Prize okay. Foundation, and in fact, I gave a copy of Spirit of St. Louis to my business partner Peter Diamandis. Okay. After he and I went flying together, I took him up flying up the Hudson River, and he got excited, and I, I and said, I'm going to finish. He, he stopped being a student pilot because he was busy getting a medical degree and other trivial crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, he got so excited that he said, I'm going to finish Greg of it. So I gave him a copy of Spirit of St. Louis to encourage him to finish his mm -hmm. flying lessons. And he didn't read it for like three years. And his parents invited him to go with them to, a, to Greece, where they had grown up. So Peter is literally two minutes from the taxi picking him up to take him to the airport. He's throwing stuff in his, in his suitcase. And he realizes he's, he doesn't go on vacation, so this is a new summer. Be gone for like ten days. I got time to read a book. I should take a book with me. He took out the yeah. spirit, and he learned about. The, he didn't know that Lindbergh was pursuing a prize. Oh, the Ortiz the Ortiz prize. prize yeah. yeah. So when he found that out, he got all excited. He, when he came back, he said, "Greg, we ought to do." And I'd been telling people for years in the space world. I've been saying that that the commercial space industry, which I was part of, needed a Lindbergh-like event. Yes. So Peter comes back and says, why don't we do a prize like the prize Lindbergh? And of course, that spoke to me. And he and I created the X-Prize Foundation. Well, and here's, here's the deal. People didn't know, and, and many people still don't know why we did it. We didn't do it so rich folks could fly in space. Yeah. We did it so that we could unstick the pro We, we want to use the energy and material resources in the ocean of space that surrounds the Earth yes. to save the Earth. Correct. Okay, to get us through the next hundred years and beyond. Yeah. So what's stopping us? What's stopping us was, and we knew this because we were in the space business commercial early, since 88, early commercial space business. Everybody said, well, this isn't for, for commercial stuff. This, that's what NASA does. So people thought only governments could put people into space. Only, in fact, only the two biggest governments. They thought it was that hard. They thought, it, they, they thought that was the only model that they knew, actually. And so the way we broke that model was by doing the prize. And that's what we set out to do. And it worked. Yeah. So when you see Bezos or Musk or, yes. in fact, it saved Musk's company, uh, the, the head of NASA that came in right after our prize was won, within weeks of when our prize was won, Mike Griffin. He's the guy who took the half a billion dollar bet on COTS, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, whereby private companies are sending provisions to the yes. space station. Correct. And he did that in, as top cover. He used the fact of Bert Rutan and Paul Allen's success. And in fact, the first day that he was the NASA administrator, he bought, he had a meeting at seven in the morning with his chief, you know, his brain trust, and he closes the door of his conference room and says to his secretary, no phone calls unless it's Bert Rutan. Oh. And word of that spread throughout NASA instantly. The X Prize Foundation uh, is an organization that we created to get human spaceflight unstuck from the notion that only governments could do it. And the technique we used to get it unstuck was the direct result of our reading Lindbergh's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Spirit of St. Louis. So that book taught us that uh, if you want to change the way the world thinks about things overnight, you could do that if you design an elegant prize. Charles Lindbergh changed the way everyone thought about aviation within a, a year and a half of his flight, the number of people buying tickets to go on commercial flights went up 30 times, and within about three years, it was 50 times. Uh, it was an incredible thing. So, uh, in 1996, my partner Peter Diamandis and I, and Byron Lichtenberg, a, a NASA astronaut, the three of us started something called the X Prize Foundation, and we announced under the arch in St. Louis a $10 million prize for the first private human spaceflight. 
so that we could demonstrate to the world that entities other than just the U.S. and USSR could put people into space. And that was won in 2004 by uh, Bert Rutan and Paul Allen, who flew twice within five days, won our $10 million, which we gave out here in St. Louis. I moved from Princeton, New Jersey, here to St. Louis, and Peter moved from Washington, D.C. to St. Louis to, to start the foundation. And because we live uh, here in St. Louis, we met Don Wiegand. And because of the relationship between the Lindbergh saga and the XPRIZE saga, we met the Lindbergh family and I became, uh, uh, I was Eric Lindbergh's flight director when he recreated his grandfather's flight for the 75th anniversary of the 1927 New York to Paris flight. What was it like for him to fly from New York to Paris in 1927 solo, really risking his life in those days? And how did it change him? It, it really changed the world's perception of what aviation could do and ushered in the, the golden age of aviation. But I wondered about it on a personal level and that got me excited and I was talking to my friend Greg here. We were working on the XPRIZE Foundation here in St. Louis and um, I said, what do you think if I flew across the Atlantic? We could use it as a fundraiser for the XPRIZE, talk about the future of flight and I wanted to give a message of hope to any you know kids especially that were facing adversity that, that there was a chance that modern technology could give them a second chance at life and, I had actually gotten a second chance, and I didn't know if I was going to get a third chance at life. So that sort of propelled me into walking in my grandfather's footsteps on the 75th anniversary of his flight. And through all this, we met Don Wiegand. Uh, 2001, when I met with Eric Lindbergh, uh, grandson, we were sitting here in the studio, and uh, we'd met because he was talking about the flight that he was going to reenact uh, in 2002, celebrating the 75th anniversary of his grandfather's flight. He was amazing meeting him and talking about that, which would have been flying a single engine plane across the Atlantic. We were meeting here before that, and I had been working with his family in the Lindbergh Foundation since 1982, again, as I mentioned. But uh, Eric had mentioned, but I'd be interested in doing something that would be a, a very big symbol f directly for the Lindbergh Foundation uh, themselves. So that they had something called the Lindbergh Award at the time, which I was aware of. And um, I said, well, maybe I, I should do the bar reliefs that I've been thinking about for years. So I created two bar reliefs, a depiction of the Spirit of St. Louis, which is this one right here and a, a Byerly portrait, uh, profile portrait of Charles when he was 25 years old. And, uh, and I learned that Don was one of the secret weapons of the uh, Lindbergh Foundation. And uh, I was invited to join the board and I am now the vice chairman of, the, of that foundation. So Don continues to help the foundation in many, many ways. And in one small way, we paid Don back a little bit, and that is that uh, in 2004, as we were preparing for the, the two flights that Bert Rutan and Paul Allen had to accomplish to win our $10 million X Prize, Don called me and he said, uh, Greg, do you think that uh, we could possibly arrange for uh, one of my sculptures? to fly in space. And it turned out that Don had had some discussions with some of the Mercury astronauts about maybe flying one of his sculptures to the space station, to the eventual space station. Uh, and, and that didn't come to pass. I, that, I said, uh, that would have been fun, but uh, uh, at this point, we were just weeks away from these flights that we'd been working on for about 10 years. and. I figured, well, what the heck, I could, it can't hurt to ask. So I asked Paul, uh, I actually asked Bert Han directly, and Bert said, yeah, have him send the stuff, we'll fly, and he did. So uh, on the second of the two flights, the one piloted by Brian Binney, 
to an altitude of more than 100 kilometers, more than 63 miles, which is the Kármán line yeah. where everybody agrees that space begins, went a couple of Don's sculptures. And they are now in the Smithsonian. So it was, uh, it was wonderful to be able to, in some tiny way, um, give something back to Don Wiegand and to the Wiegand Foundation, who have been such staunch supporters of the work of, of Charles Lindbergh and Anne Morrill Lindbergh. A lot of people don't know that they think the Lindbergh Foundation is a family foundation, uh, but it's not, even though Eric Lindbergh is the, the chairman now. That's actually somewhat of a coincidence. It's because Eric is such a strong supporter of, of the work of his grandparents. In uh, 1977, a group of people got together with Anne at the Explorers Club. And uh, those people included Neil Armstrong and General Jimmy Doolittle. And they said, we want you to keep doing the work that you and your husband are doing, or had been doing, because Charles had, had died in 1974. And most people, or many people, didn't know that uh, although both Charles and Anne were famous for their long distance flights, and Anne was a pilot, she was the first licensed glider pilot, a female glider pilot in America. She was a radio operator on the flights where Charles and Anne flew from New York to China by way of Canada and Russia and Japan. Uh, although they were famous for aviation, the fact that they made these long flights over the Earth gave them a unique perspective, the kind of perspective that the astronauts routinely get now. In fact, there's a word for it. It's called the overview effect. It's the transformation that happens when you see the Earth and you see what humans are doing with the Earth. And they were concerned about that. And they spent the greater part of their lives working on balancing human needs and technology and the environment. And this is 30 years before Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. They were environmentalists many decades before there was such a word. And people didn't understand that. They said, what are, who are these crazy people that are talking about saving wolves and whales? <laughs> What's that about? But it was very important. And, and now we all understand the pivotal nature of that. It's really the, the uh, figuring out how to balance human needs and technology and the environment is probably the number one issue of the 21st century. So the work that Don is supporting continues to this day. And it's, it is, uh, it's really important to see how people like Don have made this work possible. St. Louis has an incredible legacy of support for the Lindberghs. One of my favorite stories uh, in Lindbergh's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Spirit of St. Louis, has to do with St. Louis. Lindbergh was ready to take off from uh, Roosevelt Field on Long Island. And there were two other contestants for the Ortique Prize who were also ready to take off at the exact same time. One is Admiral Richard Byrd, famous explorer of his day, and the other was Clarence Chamberlain. And in fact, Chamberlain was going to do this trip in the plane that Charles first thought he would use, tried to buy, uh, to do that flight. So he's in a race, he's in a contest. And Lindbergh writes, with each passing day I realize that my greatest strength lies in my supporters in St. Louis. And he told the story. He said, it, it turns out that the Ortique Prize had a notice requirement, much like the X Prize had. You had to tell the organizers with a certain amount of time uh, what your plan was. From, and there was a time from when you registered until when you could be eligible to win the prize. Lindbergh realizes that although he's ready to go and he's really paying close attention to the weather more than the other contestants, here, if he goes now, he's not going to be eligible to win the $25,000 because the time is not, the notice period is not run out. And he talks about in the book um, calling back to his supporters, to Harry Knight, who was his uh, main liaison 
with the rest of the new spirit or, or the spirit of St. Louis organization. And he said essentially, I called Harry and I let him know that if I were to fly right now, I wouldn't win the prize, which was the basis for, for their relationship. He said, Harry doesn't hesitate for a second. To hell with the money, Slim. When you're ready to fly, you fly. And it gives me chills. Because today, in, in the time period of the X Prize, in the last 20, 25 years, here in St. Louis, people of that same strength and character supported us. 50 St. Louisans and 50 people from outside St. Louis signed up to be members of the new spirit of St. Louis organization. And that was our seed money for starting the X Prize effort. Yeah, the plane was, uh, was named the spirit of St. Louis and it was named after essentially after the Spirit of St. Louis organization. The plane that Eric used in, in 2002 was a Columbia 300 that was called the New Spirit of St. Louis. So some people have asked, well, what is it that gets you excited about all this stuff? Why do you do this? And it's different now, but directly related to, to what I've been working on for more than 40 years now, which is that in my operational lifetime, since I've been a teenager, really paying attention to what's going on in the world, something amazing has happened. We've come to see the Earth from uh, the distance of the moon, and then we see this beautiful blue planet, and it is completely unique in our knowledge of the universe. We know about many, many trillions of stars, and billions of galaxies, each of which has billions of stars. And in the last decade or so, we found tens of thousands of other planets around other stars. We have found zero other biospheres, zero other places that can sustain life. I'm sure there are those, and I believe there's probably other uh, conscious beings out in the universe someplace. But we have the only one that we know about, and it's absolutely our mission and our duty to save it. I'm a brand new grandfather, and when you have children and grandchildren, you have this tendril into the future, and you feel this very strong responsibility to uh, prepare the world for them so that they can enjoy it and they can continue. And uh, we know that by using the energy and material resources of the solar system, which are enormous, we can put to rest the arcane notion of the world as a zero-sum game, which, which means if I have something, by definition, you can't have it. Well, that's meaningless. Uh, in a, uh, our world gets many thousands of times the energy that it needs from the sun. We just have to be better at collecting it. We can collect it in space, day and night, send it down without any carbon. We can power our aircraft in flight uh, by transmitting energy to those vehicles. We can escape the Earth's deep gravity well and uh, uh, in different ways. We can, and we can use the resources of space to take pressure off the Earth's biosphere and actually fix it, bring it back to the, the state that it was in before humans learned to uncork the stored sunlight in carbon fuels. The problem is that those carbon fuels, when you burn them, the energy comes in packing peanuts called carbon dioxide that go back into the air. So for the last couple hundred years, a really short time when you think about it, only about five times as far away in time as Neil and Buzz walking on the moon, Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Quality base here. The Eagle has landed. That's when James Watt perfected his steam engine, and we learned to to meaningfully um, use fossil fuels. We have to do better, and we can do better. We know how to do better, but the key to doing it is is um, taking advantage of the ocean of space that surrounds us. So that's what I spend my time working on. And part of that is, is, a, is a, a greater message. And that's a message of, of hope. Humans are smart and 
can tackle hard problems. We see it time and time again. The work that Charles Lindbergh started here in St. Louis in, in the 1920s and that the Lindbergh Foundation picked up in the 1970s ha continued into the 21st century. It ignited the X Prize. It ignited our many hundreds of millions of dollars in prizes. For example, last year we announced uh, we gave away $20 million in carbon prizes for using the carbon atoms that are going up smokestacks from power plants, uh, from coal and natural gas, to make commercial products. And last year we announced $100 million in prizes for direct air capture of CO2. You asked me the question, if I had the chance to, to talk with Charles Lindbergh, what might I say to him? And I jokingly said, I might say something like, thanks for messing up my life. And what do I mean by that? Um, certainly not for messing up my life, for enriching my life. I was 14 when I read Spirit of St. Louis the first time. In one of the first days of, of high school, I had a whole new library. I was very excited because I lived in a rural area. I'd, I'd read all the stuff in my little local library that I had access to. And one of the first books I discovered in my high school was Charles's book, Spirit of St. Louis. And I never dreamed that it would have the impact it's had on my life. It, it, it caused me to become a pilot. At a, uh, I still lived at age 16 before I could drive a car, which was pretty embarrassing at the time. Um, um, I never dreamed I would have the chance to uh, work with so many of the astronauts to teach with Buzz Aldrin to, to lecture with Neil Armstrong and, and one of the founders of the Lindbergh Foundation. Um, to meet Reeve Lindbergh, the daughter of Charles, and to be a business partner as it were with Eric Lindbergh and be his flight director when he recreated his grandfather's flights in 2002, after I was unsuccessful in talking him out of that dangerous adventure. Encountering Charles as a, uh, a young person meaningfully changed my life. And I also grew up in a world where aviation was commonplace, and that was a result of Charles's work. It wasn't commonplace before, but he changed the way everybody thought about flying and it enabled my colleagues and I to change the way everybody thought about space flight, which helped ignite this present commercial space revolution. So the Lindbergh legacy is really powerful and continues to this day, and it's also enabled me to, to meet wonderful St. Louisans and see that the spirit of St. Louis is still alive and well, and that people are the entrepreneurial spirit of the St. Louis community, and their willingness to get behind uh, unknown young folks who propel them to do great things is, is amazing. Can you imagine that people here in St. Louis in 1926-27 back a 25-year-old airmail pilot who's going to fly a single-engine plane uh, against all these well-known folks? And they do it. It changes everything. When Peter D. Mandis and I walked around St. Louis in the 90s asking people to join our new Spirit of St. Louis organization and hand over $25,000, the amount of the original Ortiz Prize, so that we could make private spaceships happen. As I say it now, in 2022, it doesn't sound so silly because there are private spaceships, but there were none then. And instead of throwing us out, on our ear. People, uh, they were either polite or they said, yep, we'll do it. And they changed history in this century. So we're in the, one of the most amazing time periods in the history of the Lindbergh Foundation because it, we are coming up on the 100th anniversary of the 1927 flight of the Spirit of St. Louis from uh, across the United States and then from New York to Paris. And we decided as a foundation that a fitting tribute to that legacy would be to focus on making aviation permanently sustainable. Aviation generates about two and a half, three percent of the CO2 that, um, 
that's created by man-made activity other than farming. It's a relatively small percentage, but uh, it's one of the more difficult things to decarbonize because it requires high energy density and low mass at the same time. Uh, so we're working on that problem right now. We're creating the groups of smart people, we call them brain trusts, that can help us think through both near-term and far-term solutions to this problem. Near-term solutions will be things like sustainable aviation fuels, which use recycled CO2, but they still emit CO2 when you burn them. It's just taken out of the air first. So that's called net zero carbon. And in the longer time frame, true zero carbon flight. You could do zero carbon flight now with battery powered airplanes, but you can't go very far and you can't go very fast. The Solar Impulse, which was flown by colleagues of ours, uh, Picard and Borschberg around the world, uh, it flew one third the speed of Charles Lindbergh's plane. Uh, but we can do better, and we will do better. So those are the kind of things we're working on right now for the 100th anniversary. And there's something involved in that that we call the Frank Sinatra principle. Frank Sinatra in his song, New York, New York, says, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Well, if we can solve the problem of energy storage for aircraft, for fast, long-distance aircraft, for aviation, which is very mass-limited, then we can use cheaper, dumber versions of that to solve the energy needs uh, for other things, for terrestrial needs, not just transportation, but, but helping to do the radical shift from a world today that's about 80% dependent on fossil fuels for energy to a world that gets all of its energy from renewable and zero carbon sources. Figuring out how to balance human needs and technology and the environment is probably the number one issue of the 21st century.